Louisiana School Boards Association. We have 69 school systems that we represent, 100% um, representation. Um, we have 643 school board members. Our mission is support and leadership and service for our school boards. All right, we're gonna start with recognizing LSBA. This week we have what our annual um, 85th uh, convention. This is our 85th year. Um, we have training for our school board members. We have new school board members. We just started a new term. They had a, elections last November and um, last December. So they took office at the beginning of January. So we have a lot of new school board members here. Um, we have some veteran school board members here. Um, we have at least about a 93% attendance um, from our membership here um, today. So we're super excited. We're about to go into a legislative session, so every year um, we advocate on behalf of funding for what's called the Minimum um, Foundation, um, the MFP is, is the acronym, and we're asking for a 2.75 increase in level one. You mentioned the increase in the MFP. How has inflation hurt local school systems? That, that's a great question. Um, not only is it um, high rising costs, electricity, water, um, gas for our buses, um, also, too, food has gone up significantly. You know, we feed our students breakfast, lunch, and so a lot of our schools send our students home with snacks and sometimes dinner. It's very important to continue with the, the proper education of our students. Uh, we have not had those MFP increases in four years, and we need it because everything else in America, as you know, has gone up, and so we can't be expected to keep the level of education if we don't have the funding in the, the state should be able to do that for us. When, when we talk about the MFP and then we talk about the demands that are being placed on our school systems, well, all those demands must come through some type of funding. And without fully funding the MFP, all the school districts are cut short on what their funding ability is to do any type of curriculum, increasing the scores and accountability, or even addressing the simple needs of the school system. So we, we, we really demand now that the MFP is fully funded so that you can give us the funds necessary to do, accomplish what you're asking us to do. The increase to the MFP is uh, more important now than ever at a time when teacher recruitment and retention is such a critical issue for our state. We need to make sure that we're equipping our staff with all of the best resources in order to meet the needs of our students and the demands of the 21st century. Even in my own district right now, we are, we are having you know, many uh, construction projects and just simply because if we slow down the project, our cost on materials and everything we purchase is just outrageously overpriced. And if the funding does not keep up with the inflation, we only fall, fall further and further behind. We have experienced rising costs um, throughout the COVID pandemic in trying to meet the needs of uh, technology, safety, and health. And we see that continue in everything from our health services and food services and in, into making sure that we've got the best resources in our classroom for instruction. I live in Tangeville Parish and we've had a lot of issues with um, lack of funding because we're the we don't have I, I want to say we're the least funded because we don't have property tax that goes for education so we have uh, sales tax but we don't actually have a property tax millage other than our constitutional millage so in Tangeville Parish we look forward to having that MFP because it's very necessary because we don't have the funding we are fortunate that we do have uh, an educational district that has a one half penny sales tax that we passed last year. That's the only thing that really kind of pushed us over. So we're really hoping that we will have a raise from for our teachers as well as the MFP increase. It hasn't been increased in several years and and a lot of the surrounding schools we really need the money, you know, to be able to operate. Tell us how has inflation impacted your your school system? Oh, everything's gone up. You know, the price price of food, fuel, everything we have has gone up. And it's, you know, it's important. We, we need the money to be able to operate and operate correctly. Definitely it's necessary because of the accountability system. We need the MFP funds to 
help the students get everything that they need in the classroom. MFP increase is important to every school district in this state. It is a principal, primary source of, of revenue for many of our school boards, uh, but it, uh, enhan it, it enables uh, our all school districts to uh, uh, enhance their, their, their educational uh, opportunities for their students. So it's important to everybody. It has not been increased meaningfully in a long time, and I think the whole state would agree that our expenses are increasing constantly. So it's something that we have to be mindful of to increase as needed, but this is long overdue. Our teachers and our kids deserve it. Our districts deserve it. Public education is the backbone of our state, and it's way overdue. So I think one of probably the biggest increases has been in transportation because the price of gas has gone up so high and also the price of products. And I, I think the other thing is the supply and demand issue. We don't have enough of items at a regular low price, so we are forced to pay higher in order to get items that are in high need. Everything has increased in today's economy and our education should not be far behind and it's been a long time since we've had an increase in level one and it's time we get something done. Give us an example of how inflation has impacted your budget. Running the school buses, um, insurance, feeding the children, everything. It's all directly related. It's very necessary. The 2.75, I think this will be the second time that we would get this in 20 years. Um, we absolutely need it, not for just teachers, but also the, the total operations of of our parish, um, you know, as we're growing and with inflation and all, we really need as much help as we can get. How have costs gone up in your school system because of inflation over the last several years? It has gone, it has gone up big time, everything from fuel to just operating the buildings. I mean, we really need as much help as we can get. I mean, part of the MFP, whatever the state can do uh, to help us with that would be a tremendous help because it is absolutely affecting us. We need the increase because we need to retain our students. Our students are the most important part of our job, period. And we need this money in order to make sure that all of the things that the students need that we're able to provide. How has inflation impacted your school system? Oh my goodness gracious, that's an understatement. We lost our biggest taxpayer in our parish. That was um, the International Paper Company. So the increase in cost of things that we need to provide for our students, our teachers and everyone, then we don't have that anymore. So we need, we need more money in our parish. We need people and, and uh, businesses to come into our parish so that we can get this addition, additional tax revenue. So right now, not only in Louisiana, we are having challenges across this country in recruiting and retaining um, our teachers. And so they're looking at um, benefits. Um, they're also looking at carrying health insurance um, because that, that helps us gain people um, in the workforce um, as well. And so then that ties back to making sure that they are paid um, a, a decent wage, um, especially with inflation um, since the pandemic. We're also in support of the teacher pay raise that the governor has put um, in the budget as well. How critical is that pay raise for retaining teachers? Um, actually, it's very critical. Um, we, um, Louisiana is not at the southern region average. Um, and as other states around us are giving anywhere from $3,000 to $7,000 a year, um, we, we, we need to be climbing that, you know, that much as well. Um, because as with the southern region average, as those other states are increasing um, the, for, their, uh, for our teachers, um, we need to keep up with that pace as well. In our parish, we have two very large and very influential parishes next to us, Livingston and St. Tammany, and their funding stream is a lot better than ours, so it, we need retention, and you know, we have to do some incentives to and keep the, our teachers because it's so easy to go right next door to the next parish. So, you know, you try to come up with creative ideas for um, working in the community to give incentives from businesses for teachers. Uh, we, we also have um, certify our own teachers that Miss um, Silly created uh, a, a whole department that 
will work with our students. They take classes, we pay for their classes, and we pay for their practices in order to certify our own because there's a lot of people who go back in the field and that's also a big help and it gives them a little extra. And so that's, that's helpful for us too. So uh, retention of teachers is very important. You know, industry, we, we blessed to have as much industry as we have in St. James Parish. Uh, industry pay is probably about 75 to 80 percent of the ad valorem taxes and, and the pay and benefits are very, very good. It's hard for us to compete as a local school district with industry uh, with the pay and benefits. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's, it's very important that we're able to increase the pay and benefits for our employees to try to, try to retain our teachers, it's, but it's tough. Teacher retention and teacher recruitment is the most challenging issue that we face right now in Louisiana. And we see that trends across the nation. And we need to get creative in ways that we can uh, recruit and retain teachers into the profession. I think that what we're doing across the state right now with the pre-education pathways in partnership with our universities and helping our students to experience the education pathway while they're still in high school and even earn dual enrollment credit towards their degree is a really innovative way to attract and retain teachers. Small rural areas, we don't have a lot of local taxes to help us. So any type of funding to help support an increase in teachers pay is very beneficial to us. My parish, we, com we compete directly with Texas. So in my parish, you can drive 19 miles and double your salary. So it is important that the state and the federal government find ways to increase our teacher salaries. Teachers are leaving the state in droves and teachers are recognizing that they're not getting the routine pay increases that most industries are offering. So it is critical that we offer these pay raises to teachers to keep them in our state to get Louisiana off the bottom of most lists that they are on. Our parish is very close to the Texas state line, and actually it's a 30 mile drive over that bridge from Natchitoches. So we're constantly competing with Texas and their education system and the high, high salaries that they pay their teachers. We have a significant teacher shortage because we have a lot of people who need support, and we are below the southern average. We need to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep teachers in the state of Louisiana not have them leave and also to encourage people to go into education. We have so few people who are even majoring in education now that if we don't do something to help attract new teachers and keep the teachers we have, we're going to have a very sparse workforce. It's, it's, it is hard to find teachers. Uh, we're always trying to fill slots up with teachers and, and you know, a, a teacher pay raise, you know, paying people more is always going to help bring more people in. And, and you know, it's been a while since they've had a real substantial raise. The southern average, we're below the southern average, so we need it increased. It's very hard for us to uh, retain teachers in our parish. It's low economic, um, and we're just lacking teacher retention, so we definitely need that pay raise to help um, build that rapport with teachers, and over time, it will definitely help me and my parish retain teachers. Teacher retention is something every every school district is, is facing right now. Uh, we have approached it from the standpoint of uh, let's be proactive early. Namely, we have programs within our school system and especially within our uh, uh, vocational uh, uh, school whereby we are teaching uh, pre-education uh, courses and uh, the students are being exposed to a lot of the positives related to uh, a, a teaching uh, profession and, and career. Uh, we have also uh, uh, hired uh, additional staff and their specific purpose is to recruit and retain. You always hear recruitment, but she is uh, splitting her efforts between uh, not only recruitment, but also retention. Uh, 
it, it, again, we're trying to, to uh, more or less home grow. We, we make sure our students are aware of the uh, uh, positives about a career with the Bowes Prayer School System. And uh, we, uh, we, we make it a point to, to reach out to anyone that might find that interesting. Without teachers, we have nothing. Um, we, we need students for school, but without teachers, we can't have class. And um, in order to keep these teachers, we need to let them know how important they are, and we need to honor them as professionals. Tell us, uh, what's it like for you to recruit teachers to a primarily rural parish? It's hard. We started the four-day school week um, with the anticipation of hoping to recruit teachers, and it has worked some. Um, it's not always enough. We have a lot of industry in our area uh, with our teachers. One thing we do in, uh, with, our, with our students that are in um, class, uh, especially our juniors and seniors, we have programs that they can get involved with to become teachers, which helps uh, us also when it comes to retaining teachers. We have a very, very aggressive insurance um, program where we self-insured. Uh, it really helps them. We haven't gone up on any of their fees at all. So just uh, those right there and also just making the teachers feel important. Uh, you know, showing them respect, uh, doing little things for them. For the last three years now we've given them a December um, bonus I would call it uh, just for doing a great job. Also our teachers are plugged in with the, with the state incentives so they can also earn incentives if their classroom moves. So that really helps us too with uh, student growth. It's hard because, of, again, because of the money. And uh, young people are going into more, more lucrative professions. So we need ways to retain our teachers. We need to give them incentives to want to stay in our parish and to go into education, period. Because there are other businesses, there are other companies that are offering them so much money. So we need to show them that because of education, every other profession is what it is. And so we need our teachers to be here. The name of the task force is the Teacher Recruitment, Recovery, and Retention Task Force. Um, our, this task force is made up of a diverse uh, group of uh, educators from across the state representing all of the major groups, the school boards association, the superintendents association, the teacher unions, the charter schools, and we are working together to solve for the teacher shortage crisis. For school boards, you know, as, as school boards and school systems um, ensure that every child gets a certified, qualified teacher in their classroom, uh, the teacher shortage crisis has been illuminated through the pandemic, but also through the fact that there are fewer students entering teacher preparation programs and more t experienced teachers leaving the classroom. And so we are working on policies and procedures to help support teachers while they're in the classroom so they'll stay for longer. And what is the, uh, what's the solution to the uh, teacher retention and the teacher shortage in Louisiana? So, uh, we feel that compensation is one way that we can uh, solve for this. However, the other issues are um, making teachers feel like leaders in their school setting and improving the school culture and climate. Are you optimistic about uh, getting this problem under control? I am. This task force has been uh, very busy over the last year and a half. Uh, we've made some great strides um, working with the legislature to remove some barriers to teaching uh, with hopes for um, a, a compensation study has been done so that we can create a plan of action to, uh, to get teachers to the southern regional average with salaries. We're going to recognize our Legislator of the Year. Our Legislator of the Year represents Calcasieu, Acadia Parish, Jeff Davis Parish, and also Cameron Parish. Mr. Senator, um, Senator Mark Abraham has always been a friend to public education and the Louisiana School Boards Association. As a member of Senate Education Committee, he puts that support into action. He works across party lines and geographic lines to do what's in the best of interest of all children and educa educating our students. He's been willing to stand up to the Department of Education when they were treating our schools and our students unfairly. 
He has been willing to stand up to those who have tried to demean public education. He proves that being a conservative and being a prominent of strong public education system is in, in which we are not in conflict. So everybody give a round of applause to the 2022 Legislator of the Year, Senator Mark Abraham. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to say something, but first of all, thank all y'all for what you do, okay? And I know it's, you hear this talk all the time, but the only way, the only way that we're going to lift Louisiana up is educating our citizens. That's the only way. You got to educate them to get pro proper jobs and educate them so that other companies will come here knowing that our education system is top notch. It's not there yet. We, we all understand that, but we got to keep on doing it, doing it every year, every year. So again, thank y'all for what y'all do and thank y'all for this award. Appreciate it. My name's Jerome Henson. I've been in the school system 27 years. Um, the reason I, oh, and I'm a curriculum supervisor for the Vernon Parish School Board. And the reason I applied for this is to gain a little more knowledge of uh, some aspects that maybe I'm not aware of that, that deal with the bo school boards and then superintendent relationships and the community relationships. What have you learned so far? That very thing. Um, you know, a little bit more about uh, the laws and how the laws impact how school system run that are not quite apparent to everyone who is in a classroom or outside with a child in a classroom. What do you see as the keys to leadership? Oh, the key to leadership is to listen, to listen to people, to have a, build good relationships and trust among one another so that you openly can communicate uh, issues. I want to have kind of a heads up on what to expect. Uh, Today we did the interview process, which was huge for me, which is something I was really looking forward to, uh, to prepare for that upcoming process. And um, it was really eye-opening seeing what other districts are doing as far as their search for superintendents. Uh, but it was very eye-opening to see the relationships between uh, state representatives and senators and the impact that they have on education and how we can be advocates for our school systems uh, through them. So it's been a great process. I highly recommend it for anybody who's interested in being superintendent. My position right now is supervisor of elementary programs in the Zachary Community School District. I enrolled in this program to learn more about what is entailed in being a superintendent and see if that's something I was uh, interested in exploring in my career. Tell us, what have you learned by going through this program so far? I've learned a lot. It's been great to network and meet people and talk with their people about their experiences, but also um, in all of the various components of what the responsibilities are, you know, we've gotten great information and, and a better understanding of kind of the overall picture since a lot of times our roles on the district level are more specific. And what do you feel the keys are in leadership? I feel like it starts with relationships, collaborating with your stakeholders, um, and, and building a, a united front. This is my 17th year in education um, at Lafayette Parish Schools. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction there. Why did you get into the program? Uh, to network with other aspiring superintendents as well as to hear firsthand from superintendents about what the, the job is and what it entails. What have you learned by going through this program? Um, I mean, it's just been uh, eye-opening to see the great variety that the position, um, you know, offers and all of the different avenues you have to explore and the different functions of the job that you need to stay abreast on and current to, to really fulfill the responsibilities at hand. My name is Bobby Benjamin. I'm the current principal at the Alternative School, Natchitoches Parish Technical and Career Center in Natchitoches Parish. Uh, one of the reasons I got involved in Level Up is because I am an aspiring superintendent. Um, I definitely wanted to get more insight on the position. Uh, one of the things that I learned uh, being here is that it's a, it, it is a tough job. Um, anyone that steps into that position is, is required to do a lot. So uh, being a part of Level Up, uh, I learned the responsibilities and what it takes to be a good superintendent. Talk a little bit about what, it, what you consider is the keys to, uh, to leadership and uh, what you've learned so far in this class. 
Uh, I believe that the keys to leadership uh, definitely two points. Uh, one is definitely building relationships uh, with the people that you're going to be working with. Uh, one of the number one things is everybody is is there to support students. So we all have a common goal. Um, uh, the second thing is communication. Uh, being able to communicate with the, everyone and keeping everyone involved is a great way of keeping and building those uh, relationships. I've been in the school system for 18 years. I'm currently a principal of a pre-K-8 school in St. Landry Parish. Um, I've done everything from uh, birth <laughs> to adult and so I wanted to get into the Level Up League just to learn a little bit more about superintendent, what does it take to be a superintendent, all the inner workings of the job itself and some of the expectations to see maybe if this would be a good fit for me. What have you learned by going through this program? Oh, I've learned so much. One big takeaway, of course, is the advocacy, but I really enjoy listening to other superintendents, current superintendents, to be able to hear what they're dealing with now, how they were able to handle some of the challenges that they had, so perhaps that if ever given the opportunity to be a superintendent in the state of Louisiana, that I could use the knowledge that they've given us to be successful as well. My name is Ron Jinko with Tangible Parish School System. I've been in the school system for 33 years. I'm currently a, one of the assistant superintendents uh, at the school system and I wanted to apply to the Level Up League uh, just to get me some more experience with uh, various topics and to network with other individuals that you can bounce ideas off and get information from. What have you learned by going through this program? But just what I had said, just that the, the good thing is that everyone, you think when you're at work that you're the only one going through those issues, but when you come to these meetings you realize that everybody's going through them, everybody bounces ideas off of each other, uh, and, and you just come up with some, some fresh ideas to bring to your district to solve issues. Hi, uh, my name is Kenny Corville. Uh, I am on my 25th year in education. Uh, I am currently the child welfare and attendance supervisor, a transportation supervisor, and special services supervisor for the Allen Parish School Board. And tell us, why did you get into this program? Uh, I, I thought this was an excellent opportunity to grow as a school leader, as a district leader, uh, and as an individual. Um, it, you know, it's a challenge, uh, and, and also to be able to collaborate with uh, some of the other um, you know, fantastic young leaders in the school system. What have you learned by going through this program? There, there's a lot. Um, uh, uh, you know, some of the great things of, of, that we've gone over, uh, advocacy, being able to reach out and, and stand up for your school district through the legislature, you know, I think is, is huge. Uh, also, the, the different laws that, that go along with, this, um, with these jobs, you know. And um, just, just, it was broken down to a level where, where it allowed us to collaborate as a team and, and get a lot of great knowledge. I'm Angela Guillory Casimir. I am Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment for the St. Andrew Parish School Board. Uh, I am a 29-year education veteran who decided to apply for this program to learn a little bit more about the role of the superintendent, particularly being able to learn more than what we just see on the surface. Tell us, what have you learned so far in this program? Uh, in this program thus far, I have learned that the role of a superintendent is one that is a very complex role that requires more than just what we typically will see in terms of just the basics. Um, we have learned about law, which is very intriguing. Uh, we've also learned about finance and then also board relations, all of which are extremely important in the role of a superintendent. My name is James Russell III. I'm serving my 26th year in public education, all of which have been done in Iberia Parish. Currently, I'm serving as supervisor of child welfare and attendance. Tell us, why did you get into this program? Well, I applied uh, to the Level Up League for an opportunity to better understand the inner workings, responsibilities, and requirements for being a successful public school superintendent in the state of Louisiana. Uh, I can say many great things about the Level Up League, but one of the most resounding impacts it has had upon me has been uh, learning how to become a better advocate for not just children, but for public education in general. What have you learned by going through the program? I've learned uh, that the importance of networking, the importance of having um, great relations with board members, uh, how communication is uh, one of the most important tenets of a great superintendent, and overall, how to, again, how to be a better advocate for public education as a whole. Um, hi, I'm Tracy McRae. I'm in Livingston Parish. This is my 37th year in education. I have been a teacher, an assistant principal, principal, 
a Director of Assessment and Accountability and now Director of Curriculum. I applied to Level Up League just as an opportunity to grow and learn. You always, I always want to continue to you know, find new things along the journey. And um, this is a really dynamic program that allows for a lot of networking and um, we've, we've learned a lot of great things. Tell us, uh, if you would, uh, what, what is your key to leadership and what have you learned by going through this program? I think the key to leadership is just being open, you know, willing to work with others and to know that you are always learning and willing to admit mistakes and grow from those mistakes and hard work, just hard work. From this program, I learned a lot about advocacy and um, legal issues probably are two of the things that stand out to me the most. Um, my name is Carly Francois. I um, currently work in Ascension Parish. I'm the director of secondary schools. This is my 26th year as an educator and um, the last 18 have been in Ascension and I applied to Level Up League because I've just left the schoolhouse as a principal and um, wanted to learn a lot more about the district perspective. So that's why I joined this program. What have you learned so far? Oh goodness, we've learned quite a bit. Um, the lessons that stick out the most have been around advocacy and um, all of the different dynamics of the superintendent's role and how complex those things are. And um, I think budgeting as well. That is something that, you know, I don't have a lot of knowledge of or experience at the district level, so those lessons have been very beneficial. Our workshop today is directed towards school safety. How that's important to you is our goal is to assess those schools, uh, put information into the infra instructors and the administrators' hands so that they can better uh, secure those schools. And at the end of the day, we can have a better collaborative conversation on how we protect our kids once they arrive on schools campuses to make everything safer in the end point for the student. What kind of safety upgrades have we seen in Louisiana schools over the last several years? Over the last several years, you've seen technology uh, where it comes in the form of cameras, where it comes in the form of a panic button uh, that the teachers can use to communicate across the administrative spectrum, but also anonymous reporting that the students have access to from their devices uh, allowed at school. They can report that, hey, something's amiss uh, even before they get on campus. So we're trying to work on the prevention side of it as well as what we do on the response side. What recommendations do you have for school leaders, for teachers, and for uh, parents and students? Well, definitely to make this uh, a holistic approach where we involve all of those voices, students, teachers, uh, parents, administrators, law enforcement, all the people who were affected by it, they should definitely be at the table so that we can have a holistic approach to it. Once you get that voice, then you can definitely make some headway on what are the right methods for your community. Um, it's not a cookie cutter approach. Some communities need different uh, avenues uh, of response than others. So we kind of want to make sure that everybody's considering all those things as it relates to school safety. Today's workshop, and I'm going to talk about what I call the four prerequisites of increasing student success. Four prerequisites. They all start with the word community. Community understanding, community trust, community permission to do things differently, and community support. You get those four prerequisites of progress, you're going to make progress in your district. That's, in a nutshell, what we're going to talk about today. What's your recommendation for Louisiana school boards? The school board association can be extremely powerful by helping to coordinate engaging communities across the state. And I want to make a distinction because sometimes people, when I say we got to engage the community, they hear community involvement. And as great as that would be, most people in this state are dancing as fast as they can to make their lives work. Involvement's tough. Engagement, engagement's different. Engagement is holding favorable attention. School Boards Association can help facilitate that in every single parish by aiding their local boards in telling the story to the people of their communities. There's a, a statement, a quote from Lincoln. Uh, I may mangle the quote, but the short of it is, with public sentiment, anything can succeed. Without public sentiment, you're doomed to failure. They call them public schools for a reason. The public in America, equal educational opportunity for all, publicly funded, publicly supported. Without those two pieces, all being based on the public, you can't really have a viable school district. So it's essential that the public come and support their schools so we can get the kind of graduates that we need. 
those who tell the stories rule society. And I want to maintain that there are people out there lying about you. They lie about you every single day. They tell stories. They tell stories that sadly other people believe in. So what we have to do is tell our story. That's my talk. I'll take questions. <laughs> we need to tell our story. And what I want to do over the course of the next few minutes is give you some insight into how I know for a dead certain fact that no board represented in this room has a line item in your budget that says storytelling. You don't have the money. Most of you don't have anywhere near the time. So I've had to think up stuff as I've gone along over the years with your help all across the country. Board members, administrators, teachers, support staff. Surprisingly, support staff has been very helpful over the years. In coming up with ideas that would help us tell our stories in ways that would cost next to nothing. So I remember speaking at the Kentucky School Boards Association years ago, and I'm a fan of anybody who's a good speaker. So I went the night before my speech to hear the first general session speaker, and he spoke at great length about this program of how we could involve the community, and it was, it was spectacular. I was ready to stand up and cheer. And then someone in the Q&A said, how much did you spend? And they said, $8.5 million. It was Charlotte Mecklenburg School District. I thought there was going to be a riot in that, board of, in that room of board members. Nobody has that kind of money. But it turns out we have a story to tell. We have a spectacular story to tell. And we can do it. So we got to tell our stories. Here's my baseline assumption. Public education is a miracle. Public education one of America's greatest assets. We are the first country on the planet Earth to have the idea, equal educational opportunity for all, publicly funded. We're the first country to pursue that idea, and it is no accident that we are the world's preeminent power. Because in public education, we have unleashed the creative genius of tens of millions, hundreds of millions of young people, privileged and disenfranchised. Public education is a miracle. We talked about the importance of telling our story. I say our, I mean the teachers, administrators, and school board members of the great state of Louisiana telling their story to the general public. The most troubling statistic in my head is that 75% of the taxpayers of this state have no children in school. So they're out of the loop. And it is a given that human beings make up stories, believe in stories, act on stories. So if you've got a large group of people who are no longer connected to the schools, they're susceptible to stories which may not be true. So it is incumbent upon those of us who know the truth about public education to engage the community and tell the story of public education's importance and success. Never really see very many good headlines. You know, it's never like Louisiana top in this or you know things really going well. And so I told her if I was ever had the if I ever had the opportunity to come back to Louisiana, I would run for office so that I would try and fix some of the problems. I was like, this is my home. If I don't do it, who's going to do it? And you know, most of my friends, you know, honestly, most of my um, um, classmates from high school, they're all gone. They didn't stay here. Not that they didn't want to, but they moved to Texas. They moved to Florida. They moved to Virginia. They moved to New York. Like they just. You know, they went in search of other opportunity. And so when I had, the, I had the chance while I was in D.C. to actually move back here, and I did, and then fortuitously a seat opened up in the legislature and I had an open election in 2019 and I ran for uh, state representative in Mandeville. Uh, honestly, I didn't know anybody. My dad is an IRS agent. So he doesn't have a lot of friends. People always ask me, well, you're young, you're in politics. That means your dad must have been somebody powerful or whatever. No, I say, my dad was an IRS agent. He had less than zero friends. I had to go out there and work. My wife and I knocked on 5,000 doors to convince them that maybe you should elect somebody who was, I don't think, what was I, 32 or something like that at the time. You should elect a young guy to try and fix things. And so 
it, it worked. I was able to convince at least enough people to vote for me, and then I got sent to the legislature. And I said the first time, you know, my first day, I was like, look, I'm not here to rename bridges. I'm not here to do the kind of, you know, uh, you know, just go to cocktail parties like some people are. I was like, I'm here to fix the big problems. Louisiana has big problems and I'm gonna try and fix it. And so the first thing I did, I wrote an op-ed and I said, look, if we wanna move Louisiana forward, we're gonna have to get rid of the income tax and restructure how we, how we raise money here. We have to look at states that are successful. Thank you. We got to look at states that are successful. Florida and Texas have grown six times faster than us in the last 10 years. Six times faster. If we don't do something and something big, we're never going to catch up to that. So one of the worst statistics that I can tell you, which is I think one of the most eye-opening, is that if Louisiana was just average, if we were just average in the country, we would all live four years longer and get a 33% raise if we were just average. That's not Connecticut, that's not Massachusetts, that's just average. And you wonder the real tragedy is that 20 miles that way is an invisible line between us and Texas. You drive across that line, guess what you get? You become average. You get three and a half years of your life back and a 33% raise. How is that possible? I'll tell you, that is the cost of bad government in Louisiana. It's three and a half years of your life and a 33% raise. So when you're deciding, hey, you're having all these candidates, everyone's going to come up to you, not just for governor, but for state rep, for state senate, everything else, you ask them, how are you going to get me back that four years of my life and that 33% raise? And if they, don't tell you a, if they don't tell you a solution that you think fixes that problem, you challenge them on it or you get them to find somebody else. Because I'll tell you, that's the real problem here. You know, of all the other stuff, I think you can sum it up in those two numbers. And so when I came to the legislature, I said, okay, let's get rid of the income tax. Here's how we can do it. I brought a bill in 2021 to lay it all out. And at first they told me I was crazy. They said, you're crazy for trying to get rid of the income tax. It's never going to work. I was like, how could it be crazy? Tennessee, Texas, Florida, they all do it every day. There's eight states that don't have an income tax. But anyway, so it's not crazy. It's just hard. It's just hard. And so when you're looking at how do you solve this problem, you got to look at where it came from. Where did it came from? How long has this been around, right? So the last time Louisiana actually added a congressional seat, when do you think the last time Louisiana actually added a congressional seat, which is the last time the state actually grew faster than the rest of the country? Anyone want to guess? 80s, 70s, 60s, so that's usually what I get. 1910. 1910 was the last time Louisiana grew faster than the rest of the country. And so I decided I should be a mechanical engineer. I was good at math and science. And took a job uh, with Shell in the drilling and production into the business at a time in the early 80s where there really weren't women in the oil business. There weren't any female engineers to speak of either. And so those were kind of interesting times, as you might imagine. I spent my first year on a drilling rig. And there weren't quarters for the women. And it was a little tough place. And there were all, certainly a lot of people who felt like women didn't belong in the oil business. Uh, but I proved them wrong. And just like any other situation where you all perhaps have been in, I knew that if I outworked everybody, proved that I was a team player, did my job, and of course never ever threw the rig foreman under the bus, that, that I would earn their respect. And I did. Fast forward over a 20-year career, I was managing Shell's central deep water Gulf of Mexico business, hundreds of employees, billions of dollars in assets. And those guys that kind of gave me a hard time at the beginning of my career were actually working for me at the end of my career. And we've maintained a, a close relationship with many of them. But I had one of those aha mom moments, as many of you maybe have. I was in the Corpus Christi airport, fogged in, and couldn't get back home. And so I called home to tell my husband, I'm not going to get home tonight. I was, you know, there looking at a big project that we were constructing offshore Texas. And our third grader was having a meltdown because he didn't know his multiplication tables and he was having a quiz the next day. And so I found myself quizzing him on the phone, you know, what's three times four, what's eight times six, et cetera. And then it was just, like I said, an aha mom moment where I said, you know what, this is not how it's supposed to be. This is not the, the mom that I thought I was going to be and the, the mom that I wanted to be. And so we made a decision for our family that was right for our family at that time for me to come home and be a full-time 
stay-at-home mom. And so you can imagine, I took all that engineering skill and, and all the, the work and the leadership skills that I learned in the boardroom to the PTA board and began doing amazing things in the school system to bring more STEM education into our classes, stronger curriculums. I focused on reading. I was passionate about making sure kids in our underprivileged schools were learning to read. And as, as Dandy mentioned, for, for, for some of that work, I was recognized with the National PTA Lifetime Achievement Award. But more importantly, because I was spending time in the schools, I was like PTA president of pretty much every school our kids were in. I spent a lot of time with teachers and a lot of time in the school systems and understand some of the challenges that I think our teachers have every single day. And then when our kids went to college, I began thinking about what's next for me? You know, what makes me happy? And what I decided in all of that, as corny as it sounds, is that what makes me happy is when I feel like I'm really making a difference. It wasn't about the job or the power or the money or any of the whatever, all the other stuff that I'd done. I really wanted to make a difference. And I felt like our state was heading in the wrong direction. Nobody in my family had ever been in politics. It was not anything I ever thought I would do. But I decided to run for the state senate uh, against an incumbent, actually, at that point in time, and beat him by 19 points. So what was kind of interesting about that, I'll tell you this little quick story. On the second day after I announced I was running for office, his campaign manager called me and said, the powers that be in Slidell, and I'm like, who knew we had powers that be in Slidell? The powers that be in Slidell have met and we've decided that this is his job, it's his turn, that you're just a PTA mom. First of all, I'm like proud I'm a PTA mom. The PTA moms is what makes our school so great. And then I'm like, game on. So I want you to know, every PTA mom that I served with, every Cub Scout mom, every soccer mom, every whatever mom, rallied around our campaign. These were people that had never been involved in a campaign before. We won by 19 points. COVID and, and Delta and Laura and Ida have grossly impacted education in Louisiana as well as people in Louisiana, as well as approaches to educating people. So we have to dig in and we have to dig out. We have to have the biggest comeback that we've ever had in the history. I use the word revival. Maybe we need a spiritual revival. We certainly do. We saw something happen in Ashbury College in, in Kentucky a few weeks ago that was surprisingly, like I said, God's given me the wisdom to know that education is the most important thing that we got to do to affect change. But we got to have a revival in education. We got to have a revival in the economy. We got to do a lot of things in Louisiana. And don't get me wrong, I'm a guy with, of hope. We have hope. Yes, we have the best state in the land. If you remember the song when we were growing up where they grow the sugar cane so grand. Mississippi flows into the sea. That's for you and me. You just ought to see the waving fields of corn early on a Sunday, sunny Sabbath morning. You can go down and you can think about the things that we learned about this state. But we've let poverty be the prevailing factor in the state. So we got to go right at it. Yes, we have every kind of economic opportunity you can possibly believe in, and I'm one that believes in it. And yes, I am a lawyer and have been for 40 years. And yes, I've been blessed. I've also been all over the world. I've been in the darkest areas in Nairobi, but yet I can go just a few blocks from a courthouse in one of our parishes, and I see people living on the ground. I've seen them living in houses without floors. And so, you know, you can compare the slums of Nairobi and think about what we have here needs to be changed. And we're better. We're better people. We're about, we're a people of faith. We're a people about family. We're a people about freedom. And so let's talk about freedom just a minute. I made some notes because I know charter schools are, are frequently discussed and, and it's an interest. You know, they're innovative, they're independent public schools and students may cho choose to attend them in exchange for their operational autonomy in areas such as curriculum, staffing, and budgets. They have to be accountable. They're accountable. If not, they lose their charter. And we have two kinds of charter systems in Louisiana and most people in the public don't even know. 
You know, we have those that are authorized by local school boards and we have those that are authorized by Bessie. And I spoke to one of the gentlemen early on in this campaign who's helped me, who helped start charter schools in Southwest Louisiana. And he told me when they first opened 10, 12 years ago, they had a fight every day. They implemented a program called Character. And today they have a fight once a year. And again, this is about bringing these kids, understanding where they're coming from. When talking to Roxanne Welch last week, she said, I get six euros in here, and that's an interagency program, nonprofits, that works with I mean, the juvenile justice. And she says, kids come in here, they're six years old, and I ask them who their mama is. What's her name? And they say, mama. No, no, what's her name? Mama. These kids are coming out of domestic violence. These kids are coming from homes that they don't have people speaking into their lives. These kids are coming from... Uh, a household where there's nothing but commands. They've done studies, they took 20 people convicted of murder in East Baton Rouge Parish, and they traced where they were from. They traced that all 20 came from households of domestic violence. They traced that none of them finished the 10th grade, and, they, and so there's statistical evidence like that that helps us lead. Now, I'm gonna be your governor who's coming in to, to make a change. We have to address education. I mean, why is it that 74% of our fourth graders can't read and 80% of our eighth graders can't do basic math? My mother was a school teacher. She was a principal. She was a coach. She would tell you that the most important voice in a child's education are the parents. And yet consistently, the parents' voices are left behind. We don't let teachers teach. We don't go back to the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic. If we did that and allowed our teachers to teach, not teach for a test, but to teach for kids to learn and expand their cognitive and creative thinking, that's how you get a promising future. We also know that not every child should go to college or is made for college. I didn't go to college right after high school. I joined the Army National Guard and worked on a farm. I learned skills. Eventually I went back to college, but you know what? If we teach kids and young adults skills while they're in elementary, junior high, and high school, and if they go to college and then they decide it's not for them, at least they have a, something to fall back upon. And I can tell you this, with a tremendous amount of certainty because I collect all of the student debt for the state of Louisiana. It's really a disservice that we're doing to our young when we send them straight to college without a vision, without knowledge, and then they fail, we load them up with debt. So we need to allow our teachers to teach. We need to allow our parents a greater voice. We also need to allow money, the money that taxpayers pay, that parents pay, to follow their child and give them a choice in that education. And then finally, we must address our economy. Of course, if we address crime and we start to address education, then the economy is going to follow. And the way we do that is by concentrating on the things that Louisiana is actually good at, the manufacturing bases that we already have, the great agricultural industries that thrive in this state the rivers, the railways, the transportation mecca that Louisiana has the promise to be. I mean, the things that made Louisiana great were actually our ports. We were a welcoming place for goods coming in and out of this country. And so we should go back to focusing on those things. When we focus on both the small and the large businesses and industries that are right here in Louisiana today, and we help them expand, the new economic opportunities become organic for Louisiana. And that's how you fix Louisiana. You know, Mississippi is beating Louisiana today. And the reason they are is because Mississippians some almost 20 years ago had enough. And they recognized that the best time to plant a tree was either 30 years ago or today. They elected a change agent some 16, no, 20 years ago 
when they elected Haley Barber to lead Mississippi as their governor, who went to Jackson and shook the place up, who brought leadership to that state. And today, they're on their third reform governor. They're doing some great things in education. They're telling kids, look, if you can't read by the time you're in the third grade, we're going to hold you back. North Carolina has put together an unbelievable educational plan that I think we can work on. But all of those things take a leader. And over the last seven years, we have led Louisiana as the chief legal officer of the state. And today, we're asking you to choose us to lead Louisiana. So we're going to recognize our artwork contest winners for 2022-2023. Uh, All right, we got our first place winner, K-5, to Leona Alexander. It was titled White Bird, Forest Heights Academy of Excellence, East Baton Rouge Parish. Next, we have our first place, 6th through 8th grade, Isabella Paula Dine, Louisiana Summer Strawberries, LeBlanc Middle School, Calcasieu Parish. Next is our first place, 9th through 12th grade high school, Haley Gleason, the King Cake Baby, Zachary High School, Zachary Community School System. Next, we have second place, K through 5, Drew Horzart, Snappin' Turtle, Franklin Elementary, Washington Parish School Board. Second place, 6th through 8, Amani Singleton, Louis Armstrong, Cecilia Junior High, St. Martin Parish School System. Next, we have second place, 9 through 12, Anna Dang Win, Sunset, Magnet Academy, Cultural Arts, St. Landry Parish School Board. K to 5, Jacob Lee, Louisiana Lanya, Live Oak Middle School, Livingston Parish School Board. Third place, 6 through 8, Dev Ivar, Swamp Scene, Glasgow Middle School, East Baton Rouge Parish School System. And then third place, 9 through 12, Abby Hughes, Louisiana Jazzy Blues, Santa Mon High School, Ascension Parish School Board. Our first winner of the 2023 LS. We're excited, um, first of all, to be in Lake Charles. We, um, we thank the community of Lake Charles. Um, they have welcomed us with open arms and Calcasieu Parish School Board and the surrounding districts, Cameron, Jeff Davis, and Acadia Parish. Um, we, we were excited to visit with our legislators who visited with us for our recognition luncheon. Um, we also have our student work, work contest where we recognize our students. And also we have a public education video contest where we recognize our students. So it's really exciting to see Um, you can visit us at our website, www.